Environmental stewardship. What does the scripture have to say about this perilous topic? Is this a political issue or a moral issue? As Christians, should we be concerned or should we be investing our time in things more eternal? Environmental stewardship. What does the scripture have to say about this perilous topic? Is this a political issue or a moral issue? As Christians, should we be concerned or should we be investing our time in things more eternal? Do we have responsibilities toward this earth as citizens of the kingdom of heaven? Or should we simply be setting our sights on the new earth? Are we as those made in his image, the stewards of Eden? As you can probably gather from the title of this series, I am convinced that environmental stewardship is one of the most misunderstood topics of social justice and holiness within the Christian community in our century. This is obviously an important topic, a relevant contemporary topic. It is a topic that our neighbors both locally and globally care about. But as I have traveled and written and spoken on this topic in Christian circles for the last decade, from college students to seminarians, professors to cattle farmers, Californians to Kentuckians, I have seen that the church is largely paralyzed on this topic. Years ago, when I was at Wheaton College, biology professor Kristen Page and I launched a first ever course at Wheaton entitled Environmental Concern for the Christian, the Bible, and Biology. We opened the course with what seemed to be an innocent icebreaker. Introduce yourself to the class. Tell us your name, your major, why you took this course. And as we moved through the 20 some introductions, each student wound up voicing the same testimony. I've always loved the outdoors, the way the prairie seems to stretch forever, bird watching, gardening, the wild ponies on Assateague, the beauty of the Ozarks. I felt God's presence and pleasure when I pursued those loves. But as a Christian, I didn't think I was allowed to incorporate that love or advocacy for those loves into my Christian identity. So I was super excited when you offered this course. Wow, all 20 some well-educated, morally minded, theologically informed students offered the same response. And when we finished the circle of introductions, Kristen and I gave the same testimony. Why? Why has the church, the historic moral compass of our society, gotten so lost on this topic? Well, one reason is clearly politics. It is evident that the traditional political allies of the church are not the traditional political allies of environmental concern. If you are pro-life, supposedly you cannot also be pro-environment. If you're a patriot, you allegedly cannot also be a conservationist. So if you're a Christian, you cannot also be an environmentalist. Environmental concern has been filed away as an issue belonging to a particular political party and has been judged guilty by association. This explains much of the church's paralysis on the topic, but it does not explain it reasonably because we know as members of the citizenry of heaven, holiness isn't actually defined by earthly politics. Now is it? No, as a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a people of God's own inheritance, there's only one set of politics we should be concerned about. And those are the politics of the kingdom of God. So moving on to a second contributing factor to the church's confusion regarding environmental stewardship, as with so many issues of social justice, we, the wealthy Western elite, have been largely sheltered from the impact of environmental degradation on the global community. We don't see how unregulated use of land and water by big business decimates the lives of the marginalized. We've not witnessed the sterilization of the fertile fields of Punjab, India at the hands of unrestrained industrial agriculture. We've not stood on the banks of the vast and vastly important Ganges River and seen and smelled the impact of untreated industrial waste, raw sewage, and incomplete cremations on this mammoth estuary. Impact that has rendered its future as a living system, in the words of the United Nations, unlikely. 
We have not walked alongside the Malagasy people in Madagascar, where 88% deforestation has wiped out their estuaries and agricultural land and has left them marginalized without recourse. And very few of us have seen the back roads of Eastern Kentucky and West Virginia, where mountaintop removal coal mining has rendered the lives of the least of these a living hell. So we struggle to understand the issue of creation care as an expression of concern for the widow and the orphan. And third, and perhaps most detrimental, has been the theological belief embraced by many in the church that the created order is bound only for destruction. The resulting assumption that it is ethically appropriate to use the Earth's resources as aggressively as possible to accomplish what really matters, the conversion of souls. As a result, the church, particularly the evangelical wing of the church, has inadvertently dismissed the issue of environmental stewardship as peripheral or even alien to the theological concerns of the Bible. So I'm here as a professional exegete, a professor of biblical studies, a theologian, and most importantly, a Christian, published in everything from cognate Akkadian idioms to popular curriculums for laity, to let you know that the stewardship of this planet is not alien or peripheral to the message of the gospel. Rather, our rule of faith and praxis, our Bible, has a great deal to say about this topic. And what it has to say is that creation care is an expression of the character of our God. So in the book of Job, God asks his servant, Job, have you ever in your life commanded the morning? Pause over that. Have you ever in your life commanded the morning? or cause the dawn to know its place? Who gave the horse his might? Who sent out the wild donkey free? Is it by your command that the eagle mounts up and makes his nest on high? When I hear these questions voiced, I echo Job's response, surely not I. I am incapable of such astounding feats. I can hardly understand these things, let alone mimic or duplicate them. Only the master of the universe can do such marvels. So I, as a daughter of Eve, like Job, I respond to creation with praise for the Creator. When I stand at the ocean's edge, when the wind silences me, when I am privileged to hold a wild creature in my hands, my heart cries out with the psalmist, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Why? Why is my heart moved to worship by the splendor of a sunset? or the staggering realities of life in all its complex forms? Why do I sit in front of my television watching March of the Penguins with my seven-year-old and find myself in awe of a God who could instill in the heart of a penguin a level of self-sacrifice that puts this believer to shame? What, what is that? And the answer is most simply because the cosmos in all of its beauty and complexity is a reflection of the God who made it. That is Genesis 1, that is Romans 1. And the impact of this creation that it has on us humans is a reflection of the fact that we are made in the image of the God who made it. So the part of us that remembers Eden sings right along with Chris Tomlin, indescribable, uncontainable, you are amazing God. Yes and amen. The sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve were designed to respond to creation with worship. But how do you get from indescribable to environmentalism? How do we go from splendor to stewardship, from holiness to hummus? Well, as with all issues of faith and praxis, we must submit this issue to a survey of the biblical text. We have to ask the question, do I see this particular value systematically represented in the text as an aspect of the character of God? Or is it limited to a marginal representation via the particularities of situational ethics? This question will serve as the framework of our study. Mm -hmm.